Hello, welcome to the Stoneham Memorial Seventh Day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill, Stoneham, Massachusetts. Our congregation has been serving the greater Boston area for more than 100 years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonehammemorialchurch.org, or by visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you and hope you feel God's presence as you join us for our weekly church service. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm so pleased to see each of you here on this Sabbath morning, and I welcome you to the Stoneham Memorial Church. Please stand for our opening hymn, number eight, We Gather Together. each one happy Sabbath to all of you how are you doing good very good well I wanted to ask you have you way have you heard of a um, sister white or Ellen G white has any of you heard Very good. Um, well, uh, who was she? Mm. Her story was impacted when she was early, when she was very young, when she was nine years old, her life was changed because she had an accident. A, um, a classmate threw a rock at her and it severely impacted and it kind of stopped, it stopped her education. And if you stop your education at nine years old, your life can really change, right? And then things, uh, for example, I was reading about her story and she got baptized in Casco Bay, Portland. And the name is familiar because that's when we go to Cliff Island, we live from Casco Bay. So I was, I was like, okay, that really relates to our church. And then her life, she has a beautiful life, which I will not go into detail, and at 17, she had her first vision. And from there on, from then on, there are many things that happen in her life and things that impact us today. And the things she wrote, the things she saw, complement and expand what the Bible says. That's not a change for the Bible. It just complements it 
and it's a beautiful message. So today, I will share with you some of the things she said about the new heaven. Do you ever wonder what will happen in heaven? We talk often, right? We talk about, for example, what things will be there, eh, what it will be like. For example, do you think it will be like hot, 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 or very, very cold? I think it will be like a nice, constant spring. Constant spring. And Ellen G. White talks about that. She, for example, she says, let your imagination picture the home of the saved and remember that it will be more glorious than your brightest imagination can portray. And I'm sure you guys, being children, have a beautiful flowering imagination when we think about games, when you're playing with cards, or when you're playing with dolls. You think about, right? You think where the story can take you. Well, Ellen G. White, Sister White says that our imagination cannot even comprehend what heaven will be like. Another of the things she says, and remember, she was a girl, she was a girl, she was just a girl just like you, and God used her, which means that he can use all of us, even if we are little. And it says, another thing she says, I saw another field full of all kinds of flowers. And says, as I plucked it, as I plucked them, I cried out, they will never fade. In that moment, she realized these flowers will never dry out. Have you ever seen the flowers, for example, you may, your mom may get flowers for Mother's Day, or you may have a flower in the front yard, you know, a beautiful hydrangea, but then you notice that the hydrangea starts changing colors. You're like, oh, it's not as bright as it used to be. Oh, it turns a little brown, and soon in the winter, it dies, and then it appears again in the spring. But here, nothing will ever fade. Another thing that says is that we enter a field full of all kinds of beasts, the lion. When you go to the zoo, is there some sort of protection between you and the lion? Most definitely, right? More than one protection, extremely well done, just in case the lions are very powerful. Says the lion, the lamb, the leopard, and the wolf all together in perfect union. And then says, then we enter a wood. Not like the dark woods we have here, says Sister White, but light and beautiful. Then she talks about Mount Zion. When we sing, for example, we're marching to Zion, remember the hymn? that is referring to this, and says, Mount Zion was just before us, and the mount was a building which looked like a temple. And about were seven other mountains which grew roses and lilies. So from the mountains grew, imagine a mountain completely covered with roses and lilies. Just the picture of it makes me smile. It said, also that there were all kinds of trees, the, the beautiful place. Said so there were pomegranates, fig trees, that they were full of fruit, that the, the branches were leaning all to the floor because they were completely full of fruit. Then it says, I saw a table of pure silver, many miles high, many miles in length. In your, in your house, how many feet do you think is your table? Is it like this one, maybe? A little, maybe you have a round table? Is it a normal table for a family will be about five, five feet, six feet. If you have a round table, it could be six feet, five feet. This is miles. And miles is like all the way to Boston all the way to Boston. And then it says that our eyes, yet says it was miles long, yet our eyes could extend over it, which means you could see everything. There was some sort of magnification. Imagine that. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, almond, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruits. It also says that there was no sea. 
and says, the sea divides friends. It is a barrier between us and those who we love. And this speaks to me because uh, I'm an immigrant here and most of my family is in Argentina. So it says like the sea divides and our associations are broken up by the word ocean. In the new earth, there will be no more sea and there shall pass here no galleys with oars. Beautiful. Do you think something will hurt in heaven? Will you get fever in heaven? Do you think you will be tired? No, we will not be tired. It says that we will not, there will not be night. We will not take naps. We will not um, sleep. And there will not be any pain. Are you looking forward to heaven? Yes, we are. And we cannot even like, sometimes we think about the most beautiful place that we've been for vacation, maybe a field full of flowers, a beautiful crystal river, I don't know, the turquoise water on the Caribbean. It will be that and so much more. And that's a beautiful reward that God has for us. Um, so that's my, my story for today. Um, do I have a volunteer to close in prayer? Bianca, would you like to pray? No? Okay. Nathan, would you like to pray? Well, thank you for listening. You did very well. Okay, come. Don't. Dear Heavenly Father, for this wonderful day that you made the food for us to eat, that you made the clothes for us to dress up and go to church, that you created the schools for us to be intelligent so we can Praise God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, Church. Today's offer to uh, reading is a reflection by elementary school teachers who talk about the experiences that they have with the kids that they teach. And in the experience, they say that children sometimes give the very, uh, the most funny and silly, uh, but yet heartfelt responses and questions. And they give us two examples. So the first one, it says, this teacher said, one student whom we thought loved school very much said this to her. I feel like I've been in school forever. When will it ever end? So that was a kid asking the teacher. And another one on another day was like, does God eat, like to eat chocolate like me? So if you spend any amount of time with children, you may realize that they tend to be curious about God and who he is. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, God says, train children in the way that you want them to grow, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Today's overture reading is encouraging us to bring our children to uh, kids' Sabbath school, because when you bring them to kids' Sabbath school, it helps them to train them to become good children and later become good citizens of our church and of our country. And when we give our offering today, let us remember that uh, today it's, the offering is going to, towards local church budget and it's gonna help to boost our children's Sabbath school as well as, as, as our adult Sabbath school. What do we say to that? Yes. We're going to pray and then we're gonna have the deacons wait upon us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to one more time come before you and we pray that you soften our hearts to be able to give to you and we ask that you bless the works of our hands and that your spirit may continue to encourage us to be faithful givers. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.
Now is the time when we come together for our pastoral prayer, and I invite those who would like to come down to the front to do so while we sing this hymn of preparation. And those who remain in the congregation will kneel with me towards the end of that song, so we will be ready to pray when the song completes. Our loving Lord, the God of creation and of heaven and earth, Jesus taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. That is how we come to you this morning. We praise you for your steadfast love and faithfulness to all your creation, and we long for the day when that creation will be restored. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our hearts cannot bear. Through Jesus, please set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open a future in which we can be changed, and grant us the grace to grow in your likeness and image. We ask to be fortified with your truth. By your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as we read your scriptures, we may understand truth. And with understanding, we may believe. And believing, we may through Christ follow in all faithfulness, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. As John the Baptist prepared the way for Christ's first coming, let our lives be a living testament of God's redeeming love to all. And as we share the good news of salvation, let us prepare the way for Christ's second coming. We long for the day when Christ will come and remove all sin and sorrow, and we will enter the joy of his salvation. Thank you for this hope. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, our scripture reading for today is in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 
no, no, verse 13 to 15. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence, steadfast, who to the end. While it is said, the day, what is it said? Today is, ye will hear his voice, how then not your hearts as and the provocation. May the Lord send his blessing to this portion of the scripture for the edification of each of us in Jesus' mighty name. Happy Sabbath, everyone. That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me to know his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. There's a place for 
Amen. Um, God works in mysterious ways, and uh, we didn't coordinate, but that is a perfect introduction uh, to what I'm about to say. Um, oh, that got very loud very quick. So, yeah, I've got millions of gadgets, so just give me 30 seconds, then we'll pray before I start. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that's the wrong one. There we go. Okay. So, if we can, I'll just uh, make a quick prayer. I mean, we're all friends. Hopefully, by the end of this short message we'll still be friends uh, remember it's God's word not mine so just bear with me okay let's pray dear Heavenly Father Lord uh, you have called us child of God you have called us your brother you have called us your sons and your daughters you have called us your friend Lord you have called us your chosen people but Lord you have called us to serve we've come here today not to serve each other not to serve ourselves but to serve in your ministry, in your kingdom. Lord, help us as we open your word, as we hear your voice today, to remember why we are here, to remember what this day, this Sabbath day means for us, to remember what our goal is in life, and to remember you and our creation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're in. Right. Becoming Nobody. Interesting title, I hope. I try and make my titles uh, interesting, maybe a little bit... Um, enigmatic or enigmatic what does it mean well um, I want to introduce a reasonably well-known character in the Bible we're going to talk about that person uh, I'll give you a clue we've talked about him a little bit recently um, so hopefully you'll know who I'm talking about but I'm going to develop that idea oh oh have I just lost my cable thank you very much okay Do I need to, oh no, we good? This is all planned. Power of technology, thank you, okay. If that happens again, just uh, wave at me, thank you. Okay, um, okay, so we'll start off. It's a bit of a mini quiz at the beginning. Don't worry, um, I won't be taking notes. Uh, who knows Joseph? If I say the name Joseph, put your, put your hand up. If you feel that you know who Joseph is, 
Okay, that's expected, you know. What about if I said that Joseph is often translated as Joseph in the Bible? But I'm not talking about Joseph, tribe of Judah, okay, we all know him. Yeah, that came from Nazareth, son of Mary. Um, we're not talking about that Joseph. We're not even talking about Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was the, the, the inspiration or, or the leader of the tribe of Joseph. Neither of those two. This is going to give you a massive clue, and you're going to remember it. Everyone's going to put a hand up. If I said Joseph or Joseph was from Cyprus, now who knows what I'm talking about? Think about famous people from Cyprus. This is the thing. No one, I'm a teacher. When you ask questions, thank you very much. Well done. If I had a sweet, I would give you a sweet. When you ask questions, no one ever puts a hand up, okay? But that's okay. Barnabas. If I said Barnabas, who knows Barnabas? Everyone knows Barnabas. So Barnabas' real name was Joseph, okay? Or Joseph. He was from Cyprus, okay? Did you know that Barnabas is mentioned 33 times in the Bible? That seems like a lot, okay? 33 times. My name isn't mentioned. My, I'm Chris, Christopher. Never mentioned in the Bible. My wife's name, Ira, mentioned, I believe, three times in the Bible. I think two um, mighty men of David and one priest or high priest, I believe. Three times. Okay, so 33 starting to sound good. Easy quiz. Okay, last quiz, I promise. Top five names in the Bible. What's the first most mentioned name in the Bible? Okay, Jesus. If you didn't get that wrong, you were in trouble. Okay, 1,281 times. Okay. Second, not Moses. Moses is third. David is second, 971. Moses, 803. Jacob, one of our forefathers, founder, 363. And then, surprisingly, King Saul. 362. So that's the top five names in the Bible. 33 is starting to sound less impressive. Okay, here's the next five. I won't read them. You can see now we get our first New Testament name there, Paul. That's Saul of Tarsus. So that's the same Paul. So Paul and Saul, uh, in that respect, the man Paul himself was named 228 times in the Bible. And then the last, there's six because it's joint 15th. There we go. So there. We get Isaac, oh that's, yeah, Joab at the bottom, because we've already had Jacob. So Isaac and Joab mentioned 129 times. That takes us the first 16 most named people in the Bible. Okay, so compared to these big names, Barnabas seems insignificant, almost a nobody, okay? But this library, okay, we call it a library, because it's more than one book, we know it's 66 books, okay? It's made up of 66 books written by over 40 authors, hopefully you can read that, that's pretty small actually. Oh yeah, you can see it on that big screen, okay. Um, over about 1,500 years or so, okay? So 66 books, more than 40 authors. We don't know who wrote a lot of the books, well, some of the books. So that's why we say 40 plus, over 1,500 years. Uh, this, again, there's no quiz on this. You don't have to take notes. Uh, 929 chapters in the Old Testament, 260 in the New Testament, okay? Given a total, 1189. You can tell I'm a maths teacher. Um, verses, 23,145 verses in the Old Testament. 7957 in the New Testament. That's about 31,000 verses throughout the whole book. Words. Okay? In the King James Version, the 1611 King James Version, there were 788,280. In my version, this New King James Andrews Version, we got a few more. Um, 783,137. Why is it relevant? Okay, I'm rambling on. Why is any of this relevant? Because sometimes we read these 66 books so often, we start to think that things are not relevant or they're not significant, okay? But how much of this book, of these books, were inspired by the Holy Spirit? All of them, every single one, okay? We know that, okay? Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, all the word, all scripture is inspired. Not some, not most, all, okay? But sometimes we get so familiar with the story, sometimes we, you know, decide that, oh, why do I need to read all the way through Leviticus? You know, come on. Why do I need to know all of that? Why do I need to read through Numbers? I'm sure people have tried. Numbers is a hard book to read through, yeah? It's a lot of information, and it seems like it's not relevant. Okay, it's not important. But 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that every word is inspired, okay? Now, look at some of these verses, okay? And again, there's a point. It's a lot of reading. I won't read it all. There's a lot of reading, okay? Going just through Romans 16. So Paul is writing in Romans 16. I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Cenchrea. Greek Priscilla and Achilla, we know those. My fellow workers in Christ, okay? So 
Phoebe, we're not too sure of. Actually, doesn't come about around again. Phoebe and Pris uh, sorry, Priscilla and Aquila, we know a little bit more of. Okay. Verse four goes on. Greet my beloved. I'm going to struggle with some of these names. Apatenus, Tenetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary. Greet uh, Andronicus and Junia. Yeah. Who are Apellus? Who are Stachius? Yeah. Greet Ampilius. Uh, greet Urbanus. Greet Stachius, greet Apelles, yeah? Paul goes on and on and on, more. So verses 12 to 16. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet Persis, greet Rufus, greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas. The list goes on and on and on. So why? Yeah, why am I reading these? Well, it's easy for me to put the names up on that board. It's easy for you to read them. It was much harder back in you know 80 AD 90 AD when Paul was writing this letter to Timothy or to, to the Romans okay paper was hard to come by Paul we believe was virtually blind and he had to write everything through a scribe imagine the effort he went through in these 16 verses of Romans yeah spelling these names introducing these people never to be heard of again who are they who are these people now, it's easy for us to think that these names, these people, are insignificant names. But Paul felt that they were significant enough to write them down, to send them to the Romans. Yeah? And as I said, writing was hard. Yeah? Can you imagine how many times Paul had to dictate this to his scribe to get these names right, to get this written down? So then we have to ask, why did Paul feel the need? Yeah? It would be very easy for us to skip through all those names and say, doesn't matter, never hear from them again, they're not relevant, they're insignificant. But then why did Paul bother? Well, I think there was a point that Paul was trying to make, okay? And it comes right at the end of chapter 16, verse 16. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Who are the churches of Christ? As I said this morning, this, bu this building isn't the church of Christ. The people inside the building are the church of Christ. The people at home watching us now are the church of Christ. The people that have gone to the Camp Marie are the church of Christ. Yeah, it's not the building that Paul is um, greeting or, or putting forward for greeting. It's the people of the church. They are the church. Ordinary, everyday people that we don't know. And we may never know. Okay? These people that Paul listed, they weren't the Davids. They weren't the Jacobs of the Bible. They weren't even the Pauls and the Peters that just about made it to the bottom of their day. Okay? But Paul felt that these people were significant, yeah? Not everybody has to be your Pastor Doug Batchelor, your Pastor Ted Wilson, yeah? But everybody is significant. We, those everyday, unknown, normal people, we are the church, okay? It doesn't matter about the big hitters, those important people that make the TV, people like you and me, people like Barnabas, we're the church. So as I mentioned earlier, Barnabas is mentioned 33 times in um, the Bible. But Barnabas isn't his real name, okay? We know it's Joseph. Now, Joseph or Joseph is his real name. What does Barnabas mean? Most of us probably know, yeah? Barn, Abbas, yeah? Barn, Abbas. Abbas means son of the, and Barn means encouragement. So son of encouragement. So Joseph of Cyprus, yeah? Remember, Cyprus is quite a long way. It's not an easy trip to get from Cyprus to, to Jerusalem. It's a small island in the Mediterranean. So Joseph of Cyprus had such a character, such an amazing character or such a character that people that knew him didn't call him hey Joseph they called him son of encouragement okay son of encouragement Barnabas the son of encouragement this is why okay Acts 4 36 and Joseph who was also named Barnabas by the apostles which is translated son of encouragement a Levite in the county of Cyprus so that's who he is so this is the first mention of Barnabas first of 33 Okay, Joseph, the tree, tribe of Levi, but not a local. He is not a local by any means. Again, Cyprus is a small island off of Greece and Turkey in the, in the Mediterranean. Um, if you've ever got a chance to go there, go there. It's a lovely place. But that's where Barnabas is from. Okay, not an easy trip. You know, you're not going to catch a bus or a plane and, and you're in J Jerusalem in a few hours. It's a long trip. I think Paul was uh, shipwrecked around that area several times. So not, not an easy ride. So... Barnabas, for, for sure, was an outsider. He wasn't, he wasn't somebody that was born and brought up in Jerusalem. He was an outsider. But they knew him, and, and they called him the son of encouragement for great reason. I've got too many buttons in front of me. I've got to remember to uh, do all sorts of things. Right, okay, so next verse. Having land, so Barnabas, 
Joseph, son of encouragement, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody here needs to go home, sell everything they own, and donate it to Stoner Memorial. I'm sure uh, the secretary wouldn't mind, and I'm sure the pastor wouldn't mind, but not a necessity, okay? That's not what I'm trying to advocate. But think of the context of this verse, okay, in Acts 4. In Acts 2, Peter's sermon uh, at the day of Pentecost, he baptized 3,000 people, and it says, and the Lord added daily to the numbers, yeah? 3,000 people at Pentecost. Now imagine, by God's grace, um, after this message, 3,000 people decided that they wanted to get baptized. That would be an amazing thing. The baptistry would be a very busy place. But can you imagine the administration of this church now, today, if 3,000 people suddenly said, I want to be baptized next Sabbath? Yeah? We would need some help. Yeah, we'd need some more chairs. We'd certainly need some help in the secretary, signing all these people in. Yeah, we'd need a lot of deacons to get all these Baptists done, uh, Baptist, you know, baptisms done. And the Lord added daily. Then, I think a few weeks later, there were 5,000 that wanted baptizing, okay? I'm sure it would be a miraculous thing, but would the church have need? If suddenly 3,000 new members walked through that door, would the church have need? I might even say more need than we've got today, okay? Today, we're lucky enough. We've got plenty of seats free, okay? There are, there are lots of places for the angels to sit today. Um, but we'd need a bigger place. If there were 3,000 people that walked in here, we need a bigger place. In the first century, this wasn't happening just once, but often, often. They went from 12 disciples to 100 or 20, 120 people in the upper room to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands. The church was growing. And it said in Genesis 15, 18, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So when God made his covenant with Abraham, he promised that if Abraham left his home, yeah, in Ur, he would give him three things. One, land. Two, he would, on the land that he's given, make many descendants. And three, through those descendants or with those descendants, he would bring many blessings to the whole world. We know, obviously, through one specifically, but in general, the descendants of Abraham were going to be a blessing. Okay, he would bring blessings to the land. So land, descendants, blessing. Owning land to an Israelite was a big thing. So big, in fact, that every 50 years, yeah, in the Great Jubilee, you would be expected to give any land that you bought from a different tribe back to that tribe, because owning land inside of a tribe was, was not just important, it was vital. So for Barnabas to sell his land, that was a massive sacrifice that we can't really understand, okay? It's more than selling your house and moving into an apartment. It's, it's much more than that, okay? But he encouraged the church for his wallet. Now, we've just had a collection. All of us have got wallets or something we can collect money in. You know, that's something we can think of. Again, I'm not asking for your money. But in Barnabas's day, there was a need. Barnabas saw that need and was prepared to go all in. I'm going to sell my land and I'm going to give everything. Yeah? Um, and he brought it to the apostles' feet. Okay, is there something more that each of us can do? Okay, is there something more, is there a need in the church that each of us could meet or one of us could meet? Um, now, this is it. All that Luke writes, assuming that Luke is the author of, uh, of Acts, as we think he is, I think it says 15 words. Barnabas makes this massive commitment, this massive, let's call it a sacrifice, and he donates all of his wealth to the church, and Luke writes 15 whole words. That's it. Never mentioned again. Okay? He wasn't the only one that was compelled to. Again, talking about Ananias and Sapphira, we know the story. We won't necessarily read through the story, but you know that in the same story uh, we have Ananias and Sapphira that decide to do what Barnabas has done, and they sell their land, but then they sort of think, oh, well, we don't want to give all of our money. So in the end, they just give half of the money. But giving half of your entire wealth sounds pretty good. That sounds like a big commitment. I, I've never made that commitment. Maybe none of us here have. But here's the problem, and this is why it's important, okay? Because in Acts 5, 3 and 4, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own to control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So they weren't selling the land. If they had sold the land and promised to give half to the church, I'm sure 
church would have been very happy, very blessed, and we would never heard this story. But they changed their mind. Their motivation wasn't like Barnabas to give. Their motivation was perhaps jealousy of what Barnabas had done, and they wanted to copy that idea. Okay? They wanted to be part of the community. Yeah, well, Barnabas was welcomed into the community. He was an outsider. Now, Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to, to have that sort of recognition. Okay? Now, this might be the only thing that we remember of Barnabas. He sold his land, he donated it. Of course, we know that there are 32 other mentions. Okay? If you know the book of Acts, you probably know um, the two characters who are mentioned most in the book of Acts. Uh, in the list that I put up, the top 16, both of those people are there, Peter and, of course, Paul. They are the main names that we read through the book of Acts. Obviously, Saul in, those, in, in early Acts, but he later becomes Paul. So who was Saul? Okay? We meet Saul in Acts 7, um, when the people of Jerusalem drag Stephen out, we talked about Stephen this morning, um, and stone him. Okay, so Stephen gets stoned. Um, and it says, and they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now that is the first mention of Saul. I think we can probably agree that is not quite as an encouraging first entrance as Barnabas. Barnabas, having land, sold it and donated. Saul collects the coats as Stephen, our first martyr, is being stoned. Not the greatest of introductions into the Bible, okay? But it gets worse. We, we're not going to talk about Saul all day, but it says, Saul goes around creating havoc yeah, against the church. He's dragging members of, of the church, the way, as they were called those, out of their houses, sending them to prison. Worse, as we saw with Stephen. On his way to Damascus, we know that Saul, as a Christophany, he meets Christ on the road. But the people in Jerusalem don't know that events happen. So Paul is riding to, or Saul is riding to Damascus. He meets Christ on the road. Nobody in Jerusalem knows this. Okay, they haven't, they weren't with him. Saul then preaches, we believe, for a few years uh, in the gospel, or preaches the gospel that he knows around that area, around the Damascus area, um, for a while, okay? Maybe a couple of years. But again, the people in Jerusalem don't know that. Eventually, Saul, yeah, Saul of Tarsus, possibly the most hated and worst enemy of the church and in that time, returns back to Jerusalem, cap in hand, to the holy city, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Wow. Imagine that conversation. Walking into the church, Saul of Tarsus walks into the front door of the, of, the, of the house, sorry, whatever, upper room they were in, and he wants to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out why. And did not believe that he was a disciple. Again, perfectly understandable. Yeah, clearly they thought he was trying to you know, infiltrate something or do something nefarious for some reason, and they were wary. As I said, he was by far the most dangerous thing that they had come across at this point. Um, but at this critical time in Saul's journey with Christ, yeah, Christ has been redeemed. He has completely turned his uh, ideas around. He's repented 180 degrees. Instead of now being completely zealous against the church, he is completely zealous for the church. But he's being rejected. Yeah, he's been sent back in by the church. Verse 28, Acts 9. Sorry, verse 27, Acts 9. But Barnabas, second time he mentioned, took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, how Paul had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now, that could have been an end of Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus in the Bible. He goes to Jerusalem, tries to join the disciples. They say, on your bike, son, no chance, and off he goes. End of Paul, of, you know, or Saul of Tarsus. Paul, the apostle, never becomes, okay? But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Was Barnabas on the road with Paul when he met Christ? No. Was he in Damascus when he was preaching? No. So Barnabas effectively took Paul at his word. Honestly, I've done these things. I'm a changed man. Barnabas steps in and not only defends Paul, but advocates for him. Yeah, so he takes Paul at his word, and certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm sure Barnabas was inspired, but just after meeting Paul, he stands up and says, I'm with this guy. Yeah, and that's important, because imagine if Barnabas had just thought, it's none of my business. It's church business, I'm an outsider, I don't really want to get involved, I'll leave it to the pastor, I'll leave it to the elders, those guys know what they're doing, I'll leave it to them. I shouldn't get involved, it's not my business. Yeah, Pastor Peter and all those elders, 
They know what this guy's like. You know, I'll keep out of it. Imagine, yeah, if he just stands aside and awkwardly keeps him silent, minds his own business, yeah. But thank God Barnabas decided to encourage the church with his voice. He's encouraged with his wallet, now he's encouraging the church with his voice, yeah, because there would be no Paul without Barnabas. And what would make this library, yeah, remember, we talked about Mark, we're going to talk again about it, I know he studied this in the first uh, lesson of this quarter, but it's only, I'm going to briefly go over it again, yeah. How many books did Paul write? Quick, quick. <laughs> Out of the 27 books of the New Testament, it was a lot, okay? I think 11, Pete, I know Peter's counting. I think it was 11 of 27 books. It was, it was a significant amount, okay? But he wrote, you know, that library of books here, or this library of books, would be a lot lighter without the introduction of Paul, yeah? So Jesus once made an analogy that the church is in the world, but not of the world, okay? And I know that we like, as Seventh-day Adventists, to think of a boat. Yeah, a boat is in the water, yeah, the, the world be in the water, the sea, but the sea, hopefully, isn't in the boat. Well, we're all in the same boat, but is the church sometimes a little bit like this? Okay, I'll let you read that. Yeah, we're all in the same boat, but sometimes you're at the right end of the boat, sometimes you're at the wrong end of the boat. But you can rest assured, if or when that boat sinks, those guys that are feeling pretty safe and secure at the front of the boat are going to get just as wet as everybody else. Okay, we're all in the same boat. So if the guys at the back of the boat are struggling, need help, the guys at the front of the boat are struggling and they need help. They just don't know it yet. So instead of doing, what, doing and saying everything that everybody else might have done and said, Barnabas did the right thing. Okay, instead of sitting back and waiting for other people to take control or to do what was needed, Barnabas did the right thing. Okay, he was clearly not convinced with Paul's conversion, yeah? Um, when it was time to get go out to the Gentiles, they sent Barnabas and Saul. So the, the people in Jerusalem, they kind of take Barnabas' word for it, but the first opportunity they get, they need people to go out to the Gentiles, guess who goes? Barnabas and Saul together, okay? We'll flick through a few verses of Acts. Okay, again, just to make a point. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, and when they had fulfilled their ministry, and uh, sorry, when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So John Mark goes with them. Yeah, as we said, we studied this a little bit at the beginning of the lesson of the quarterly. He's a cousin of Barnabas. We know him better by Mark, the author of the Gospel Mark that we're reading through, that we're studying. But look what happens on the journey. Again, no surprise. Now in the church uh, that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Saul. Now separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, yeah? In Acts 12, Luke writes Barnabas and Saul. In verse one and two, here, Barnabas and Saul again. Barnabas and Saul again. Then in Acts nine, all of a sudden, it says, then Saul, who is also called Paul. So this is where Paul comes into the forefront. He's no longer Saul of Tarsus, he's now Paul, yeah? Filled with the Holy Spirit, looking in, uh, looked intently at him and said, oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you are the son of the devil. So from that moment on, Luke writes, now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, Paphos uh, Paul and Barnabas, yeah, we can see that there, and then at the bottom, and contradiction and blasphemy, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. So it was Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Then Saul was known as Paul, now it's Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, the things of Paul. Okay, so suddenly, almost, in Acts 13, 9, we see the Holy Spirit come on Saul, and Paul is reborn, okay? Uh, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, yeah, you've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit, of the fire. So from that moment on the Luke, uh, from that moment on Luke writes, uh, oh, we've got that, okay. So Paul and his party, yeah, Barnabas still isn't in it for the glory. He advocated for Paul, he defended Paul, he went with Paul, but not to take glory for himself. He was building Paul, yeah? When he took Saul, he was building Paul, yeah? He was ready that when Paul was ready, Barnabas takes a step back, he fades into the shadows, yeah? He led Paul to become a leader. He didn't lead Paul to become a servant. He led Paul to become a leader. So that when he was done, he could fade into the background, yeah? In the background, but as we're going to find out, he was not 
idle. He didn't just sit in the background and do nothing. But again, where Barnabas sees a need, he gets busy. He doesn't sit back and wait for someone else to do it. So we hear of Barnabas a couple more times in the book of Acts. Here's another example that we sometimes forget that Barnabas was even involved, okay? Because Paul is such a big character now, all of a sudden we don't even remember sometimes that Barnabas was in these events. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. But when they get back to Jerusalem, then all the multitude kept silent. People didn't want to speak about this idea of the circumcision. Yeah, if, if new converts were brought into the church and they were Gentiles, did they need to be circumcised? Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul. Suddenly, Barnabas is taking the lead again. Yeah, there's a need. There's a problem. People are too quiet. Barnabas stands up and he declares how many wonders and miracles God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So once again, encouraging those in need. The Gentiles needed somebody. Who was going to do it? Seems that Paul wasn't going to do it. Barnabas stands up. How many of the events have we read so many times in Acts and we attribute them to Paul and we simply forget that Barnabas is there? Okay? But he is there in spirit and truth. He's not just there in the background. Barnabas is there, serving, doing what is necessary, taking control when needed, sitting back when needed, looking at the needs of the church, doing what it takes. Yeah? So not just taking the mission to the Gentiles, they brought it back home to church and openly encouraged them in the church, even though it clearly wasn't a popular thing, yeah? And it maybe still isn't. Yeah, when we talk about outsiders and, and undesirable people that you, know, that you don't necessarily want sitting next to you in church, how keen are we to encourage those people to come? Okay, so one of the last times we hear about Barnabas, and I'm gonna to get to a point because we're all hungry and it is very, very warm in this building. Uh, so Acts 15. Verses 36 to 38. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go, now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John Mark, okay, John called Mark, we know that that's Barnabas' cousin. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them uh, the one who had departed them in Pamphylia and had, gone, and had not gone them to do the work. So we won't talk about that, again, we've studied it, but let it be said that Mark didn't start off his journey so well. Paul isn't so keen now to take him again. Um, so John Mark lost heart along the way, and who can blame him? It must have been a tough time. But Paul is saying, we don't want to bring Mark or John, uh, John Mark. Barnabas is saying, we're definitely going to bring John Mark. So in the end, they split up. Okay? In my Bible, they said they had sharp contention. So that's, you know, that's a reasonable argument, I would imagine. So Paul doesn't rely on him or doesn't think they can rely on him. Um, which is ironic because, as I think we said a few weeks ago, you know, he would have been abandoned if Barnabas hadn't stood up for him just a few chapters before. You know, so he was, when he was new to the ministry, he was in exactly the same place that Luke, uh, sorry, that Mark is in. Uh, but Paul all of a sudden has lost that patience and doesn't want to take Mark. But once again, Barnabas is going to fend for the people that can't fend for themselves and he's going to go with Mark and off he goes. Okay? Um, of course, we're studying Mark and we know the books or the book that Mark wrote. Again, this Bible would be a lot lighter, especially if you consider that Mark, I think, is believed to be the first of the four Gospels and the other Luke and John, uh, sorry, Luke and Matthew, uh, the, the other synoptic Gospels draw a lot from Mark. So without Mark's writings, there would have been a lot less in the Gospels, I believe. Uh, so again, something else that would have made that Bible a little bit lighter. Okay, let's push on. So we go into 1 Corinthians here, and it says, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me, this is Christ speaking, of course, uh, sorry, Paul speaking, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Such a simple statement, but so profound. Imitate me only because I'm imitating Christ. If you do what I do, and I do what Christ is doing, you're doing what Christ is doing, okay? Um, in my Bible, in the New King James Version, these eight words are under a heading of their own. So there's verses, then a new heading, worship and the Lord's Supper, eight words, imitate me just as I imitate Christ, and then a new heading. Those eight words get their own special heading in amongst 
chapter 11 of Corinthians. Okay? So it's a special heading all on itself. Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Great advice. But here is the easy to, uh, point to miss. Okay? Where did Paul learn to imitate Christ? Philippians 2, 7, 8 says, But made himself of no reputation. This is Paul talking of Christ, or writing of Christ. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So of course we know this is about Jesus. But wasn't Barnabas imitating Christ when he made himself of no reputation? Yeah, when he came as a bondservant, when he sold his land, when he stood up for those that needed standing up, when he humbled himself and took a step back and allowed others to take the lead. And then finally he faded away into the background, never to be heard of again. Yeah, he was a leader, but he didn't push to become one of the leaders of the church, like Peter, James, Paul. Yeah, all these people, they were, they were even arguing at points about who was going to be the greatest. Barnabas wasn't involved in that. He doesn't care. And now Paul the student is becoming Paul the teacher. Yeah, teaching exactly what he had learned from Barnabas. The man who not only defended him when he, no one else would, but who encouraged him, led him, taught him, and then left Paul to answer his own calling when he was ready. So Paul writes to Timothy about Mark, 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me, get Mark, that's John Mark of course, and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. So it seems that Barnabas' last lesson to Paul was this lesson of humility, forgiveness, giving guys a second chance. Because Barnabas was all about second chances, and God is all about second, and third, and fourth, and fifth. Paul, after all, had been in the same position when no one else was in his corner. It says, Paul says, at my first defense, no one stood with me. It's kind of a half truth there, because we know someone that did. Yeah? All forsook me, apart from Barnabas. May it not be charged against them. Okay, not all forsook Bar uh, Paul. Yeah, there was one that was left there to encourage him. One that even, though it wasn't the popular choice, stood up and decided, I'm gonna be with you. So we know very little about Barnabas. Nothing more than we've just read today. But when you consider that Mark is thought to have written the first gospel, as I've just said, we would be, and, and Paul, oh, 13, I wrote it down here. So Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. So that's at least 14 books that would maybe be missing. Maybe a few that would be lighter, yeah? Because Paul and Mark hadn't met Barnabas. Um, so we start to see the huge part that this seemingly nobody Mr. Nobody, somebody that just came out of Cyprus, not a, not a local, this outsider came into the church and gave and gave and gave encouragement. And how much, how much did he do, how much influence did he have on these scriptures? Okay, the 33 times, he didn't win Best Elder, he didn't want to win Best Elder. Yeah, he knew that he had nothing, uh, he, he'd been called to do nothing more than to encourage anyone and everyone that needed to be encouraged. So, and we are coming to a close, Barnabas was prepared to encourage with his wallet. Barnabas was prepared to encourage with his words. Barnabas was prepared to encourage with his leadership. Barnabas was prepared to encourage with his humility. Barnabas was prepared to encourage with his determination to stand up for anyone who had no one else to stand in their corner. So there's a famous story, okay? I'm sure you've heard it, it's an old story. I didn't make this story up. So the famous story about everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody, four people. So there was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody knew anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could do. Okay? So be a nobody. Be that nobody. And do the thing that anybody can do, everybody should do, but nobody's doing it. What is that thing? Look around. Yeah, there is something in this church that needs to be done, and there is a nobody in this church that can do it, that should do it, that can do it. So, 
Why not be the nobody that does the work that anybody could do and everybody should do? The early writings of Ellen White, page 16, she writes, we all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus bought the crowns and with them his own right hand placed on our heads. Some of them had very bright crowns, others not so bright. Some crowns appeared heavy with stars, while others had but few. All were perfectly satisfied with their crowns. So I believe it's 10 years later in the Signs of the Times when Ellen White writes again about this and clarifies what those stars are. So in Signs of the Times, I haven't got a page number, sorry about that. Um, and she says, yet there will be no one saved in heaven with a starless crown. If you enter, there will be a soul, that's what the stars represent of course, in, that, in the courts of glory that has found an entrance there through your instrumentality. So your crown in heaven will have as many stars as those people, those souls that are there because you had a part to play. How many stars are on our crowns? How many people have we actively encouraged, lifted up, exalted? Yeah. Imagine the feeling of getting to heaven and someone you know, or maybe you don't know, coming over and embracing you and saying, you are the reason I'm here. I wouldn't be here unless you said, unless you did, unless you showed me, unless you led me, yeah? unless you supported me, unless you encouraged me. I wouldn't be here today. Imagine that feeling. Yeah? Sometimes all it takes is a little encouragement. Okay. Um, oh, hang on. I'll come back to this. I'll let you look at it for a moment, just to let it sink in, okay? But um, I want to read Proverbs 27, 17, which I don't appear to have written down, so I'll read it. It says, Proverbs 17, uh, 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So a knife, you sharpen on a whetstone. You get a stone, you know, these whetstones, and you sharpen a knife or a blade or, or some metal on a, on a whetstone. But to get an even better edge, the chefs, you see it all the time, they, they get two knives and they just rub the two knives together because metal, iron, sharpens iron. So to get that perfectly sharp edge, you start off with a whetstone, but then to get that very clean edge to clear off all the dullness and all the, all the imperfections, they, you sharpen a knife with another knife, okay? Now sharpening is purposeful, it's precise. You don't sharpen something by accident. If you just you know, haphazardly try and sharpen something, you're gonna make it the opposite, you're gonna make it dull. You're gonna break the blade or it's not gonna get sharper. You have to be very purposeful, very precise, yeah? Very thoughtful about how you're gonna sharpen something. The angle, the way, the metal, the, the material you're gonna use. So we don't come to church for ourselves. You can listen online. We could all be sitting at home, listening to this message or any other message from the comfort and coolness of our own homes, but we're here, okay? Why? We aren't here, uh, hang on, sorry, I've lost my place. So, yeah, we're not, we're, it, it's intentionality, okay? We don't come to church for ourselves. Yeah, we could listen online. It's the community that we need. We sharpen each other. As we come together in this congregation, this group, yeah, this convocation, as it says in Leviticus, we sharpen each other. We make each other's lives that little bit better. We lift people up. We encourage simply with words, sometimes simply with a hug. I'm not much of a hugger, so don't hug me, but with words, with a hug, with a, you look great today. It's good to see you back in church. How have you been? How are you feeling? Iron sharpens iron. People sharpen people, okay? So are you in church because you've got something to do, or are you in church because you want something to do? Have you just turned up today because you've got nothing better to do, or if you come here because you want to do something for somebody else, for your church. And remember, the church is not these four walls. The church are these 150 people sat in front of me, and the 150 people of the membership that aren't sat in front of me. Okay, so here we go. Who can guess what that is? It's a church. It's our church. Can you guess what time it is? The time isn't exact. It's about 9.45, I think. It was just at the end this morning. Every morning, the church doors open before 9.20. Our deacons that are here have a massive job of getting all these windows open, which, believe me, I've tried and helped sometimes. 
It's harder than it looks to open and keep these windows open. Trying to get the building a little bit cool, getting all the food downstairs, getting everything prepared downstairs. They are busy at 9 o'clock, 9.20, the doors open, the music will start. Whoever's here, in fact, I think at 9.20 there were four or five of us. By 9.40, maybe a dozen. Look around now. Look around now. Okay, if I could take a photo now, you could see there are a lot more than a dozen people sitting in this building. It's Camporee weekend. Yeah, lots of people and members of this church are away. So we could be even more, 50 more today, maybe 100 more today. Okay, the point is, at 9.20 this morning, who works? Quick, quick, quick raise of hands. Who, who amongst us works? I've got a job. Okay, it doesn't matter if you work or if you don't. If you go to work every morning, if you couldn't make it to work before 9.20 in the morning, would you still be employed? I wonder. Maybe. Maybe you work shifts. Maybe you work nights. Who knows? You get my point. Okay? I agree that the Sabbath is a day of rest. But it isn't a day of lions, necessarily. Okay? If you can get up at 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock on a weekday, you can get up at 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock on a Sabbath. You can make it to church. You can make it to Sabbath school. Um, this isn't the best introduction that I, you know, that I could ever make, but I am the new superintendent of Sabbath school. And I was very pleased that Egan made a, a, a shout out for the children's Sabbath school. Sabbath school is so important. You guys now are all sitting there very uncomfortably listening to me lecturing you. Okay? It's a one-way conversation. Sabbath school is not. It's a discussion. You can say what you want. You can listen. You learn I learn so much. Everybody involved learns so much. It is such an important hour of the day. Yeah? We missed you this morning at 9.45. More importantly, God missed you this morning at 9.45. He wants you here then. And we all do. Okay? If you can't make it, tell us why and we'll see what we can do. Yeah? We want you here and we will do what we can to get you here. If you think there is nothing for you to do in the church, think again. If you can sing, volunteer to sing. If you can't sing, volunteer anyway. We'll plug our ears. If you can save our ears and read the scripture or the children's story or whatever, look through the, look through the bulletin, the program, see all those jobs that need to be done every Sabbath. Yeah? Somebody needs to coordinate those jobs every Sabbath. We need people to say, I'll read the scripture today. I'll happily give the children's story. I can sing. I'd love to sing. I want to read this. I want to read the worship in giving. Yeah? We need people. We need you. Nobodies. Every day, nobodies like me, like you. I'm sure that the deacons downstairs would very happily sit down while other people volunteered to serve. I'm sure that the, the children's Sabbath school would love to have assistance, helping them to control uh, you know, the, the, the students in there. Um, there's always something you can do. Yeah? Make a commitment. If you don't want to read, you don't want to sing, Turn up to Sabbath school. That's a commitment. Yeah? I'm going to make an appeal. I don't often make appeals, but it's a very easy appeal. You don't even have to stand up. Okay? All you need to do for this appeal is get your device, your phone, whatever it may be, out of your pocket. Okay? That barcode, hopefully, if we can leave that up for a while, guys, that barcode is going to take you to a very, very simple um, questionnaire. I think less than 10 questions. I would be prepared to read the scripture on a Sabbath morning. You're not going to do it every Sabbath. You might not do it for months. But the coordinators, those people that are worship coordinators, they'll see your name there with a little tick. They'll see your phone number there. And they'll think, I'll give brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so a call today. And they can read the scripture for us. They can sing for us. They can give the children's story for us. Yeah. At the end of this form, there is a very important couple of questions at the bottom or question at the bottom. Today, I would like to make a commitment that I am going to try and make Sabbath school most Sabbaths. That's not 9.20 every morning, but most mornings. Sabbath morning. Get your breakfast a little bit early. Get the kids out of bed a little bit earlier. Get in the car a little bit earlier. We would love to see you here at 9.20 in the morning. Okay? So there's a little box between you and God. I would like to make a commitment that you're going to try and be here for Sabbath school early. Then there's another box or a question underneath it. I can't make it to Sabbath school because. Tell us why. 
If you cannot, for whatever reason, make it to Sabbath school, tell us why. We have got great elders, great leaders. We will sit together and do what we very well can to make your life easier so that you can get here easier. Maybe it starts at the wrong time. Maybe it's the wrong place. Whatever. Whatever it happens, you tell us. Okay? So, that's it. There is somewhere you can help. Okay? I promise you. Yeah, find something that nobody is doing and be the nobody. If there are empty positions in the church, fill them. Yeah, we've just had our officers elected. We voted for them a few weeks ago. If those positions are already filled, overfill them. Yeah, they, we cannot have too many people doing too much in this church. It just makes me think back in the day when Solomon was building the temple and they asked for people to bring and they had to send the high priest out to say, stop bringing stuff. We've got too much. Stop bringing stuff to church. We can't handle it anymore. Where are those days? We would love those days to come back at least in partial. Okay? Bring stuff. Bring yourselves to church. If there are too many positions, overfill them. Encourage the people that are doing them. Maybe they need a week off. Maybe they're not feeling great this week. Maybe they just need an extra pair of hands. Ask them. Next time someone asks you if you're available to serve on Sabbath, why not say, yes, I'd love to. So will you volunteer? Who will you encourage? Who will you sharpen? Barnabas was not special. He was just an everyday person. And that's what made him who he was. Yeah, the next time you read Mark, Luke, any of the Gospels, Acts, any of Paul's writings, think of Barnabas. Think of the things that he did for us, for the Bible. We are the church, everyday, nameless people like us. Yeah, we all have something that we can do that's what makes us special because there's something that you can do better than anybody else but are you doing it one thing i would say as well obviously if you're not here today you guys okay you're here if you haven't scanned it or if you're thinking if you're sitting there thinking oh i'm not sure if i want to commit then go home go onto youtube re-watch this entire message and then scan the barcode at home okay god bless amen
forgot to mention as well, if you haven't got a smartphone, I'm sure there are still some of us that don't, just come and speak to me and say, I would love to do this. My name is, my phone number is, I'll write you down. Okay, so there's no excuse. Um, okay, all right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are our Creator, but you are our friend. Lord, we want to do things for our friends. We want to help our friends. We want to encourage our friends. Lord, you have done so much to encourage us. You have done so much to lift us up. You have forgiven us so many things. You have given us mercy. And Lord, we know that your mercy is enough for us. Lord, everything that we do is for you. So help us, Lord, to serve you. Help us to serve you with our wallets, with our time, with our voices, with our hands, with our feet, whatever it may be. Help us to find something that we can do for you. Lord, you are calling us to be active, to work while the night is here. Yeah, because someday, uh, well, sorry, work while the day is here, because someday the night will come and we will be working no more. Help us to be actively working in your service. Help us to find your Holy Spirit within us that will convict us of that one thing, those two things, those few things that we can do to encourage others around us. Thank you, Lord, for your voice, for your message, for your word. Thank you for being here with us today and for your Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you would like to get in contact with us, please visit our website at stonehammemorialchurch.org or call us at 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person at our church on Saturdays for our 1055 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer and fellowship at 630 p.m. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace.